I'm so excited to be able to speak the Word of God to you today. And we are very sadly wrapping up our Find Your Beach series. Today is it. And you know, this week is going to be the coldest week so far in the season. You know, we've got a victory missions trip coming up this summer to Belize. You could think about that a little bit. No beach time, really. One afternoon, that's about it. Uh, or, but it's warm. Or, uh, you know, Israel, it's not a missions trip, but we have a, a trip to Israel planned for October. You can find that on the website and go ahead and put your deposit in for that. Already is one-third filled after just one announcement. So, uh, you know, sign up for that. But uh, beach, what do you think about when you think about a beach? You think about escape, right? You think about escape from reality, but we've seen in this series that finding your beach in God is anything but an escape. First of all, we saw that when uh, Jacob was facing some difficult times, some challenges, and God wanted to expand his vision, he pointed Jacob to the beach, and Jacob was reminded that God had promised that his descendants would outnumber the sands on the seashore. God has an expansive promise for you that sometimes you can only discover when you let God take you to that place of peace. And where do you find peace? We talked about this last week. We talked about finding peace in the presence of God. Even if we walk through the valley of darkest shadows, we don't have any fear. We're at peace because our God is with us. His presence is not an escape. His presence is a way of life. Amen? That's the way we live. And today what we see is that God brings us to our beach, a place of peace, when we embrace and pursue His purposes for our lives. So it's not an escape. It's, if anything, it's running toward God and running toward what he has for you, what he has for you to experience, but also what he has for you to do to help people experience the freedom that you yourself know if you have a relationship with Jesus. Amen? And so we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 8, and we're going to begin with verse 19, even though most of the time when people preach this passage, they begin with verse 22. But we'll see very easily that the reason that we have verses 22 and following is because of verses 19 and 20 and 21. So it says, Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. So Jesus said, bring them in. No, he didn't. He gives a very surprising response. He replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Huh? He redefines the family of God. He redefines his own family. Those who hear God's word and put it into practice. And then we have a story that Luke puts in right after that. It's not a parable, but it is a story that is like an acted parable in that it makes the same point that Jesus has just made by defining his family as those who hear his word and put it into practice. So it says, very next verse, one day Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out in search of their beach. No, that's not what it says. <laughs> so they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep, meaning Jesus fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. They just weren't just afraid. There was real danger here. The disciples went and woke him up saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. Mark even says they questioned whether Jesus cared or not. Don't you care that we're drowning? He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where's your faith? He asked his disciples. 
In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Now, what's the point of that story? I've preached on this passage sometimes before, and I've heard many other sermons on this passage, and usually you would walk away from a sermon on this passage and think, Jesus brings peace to all my storms. Whatever storm you're going through in life, Jesus is able to command that storm to be at peace. And there's some truth to that. It is true that he can calm every storm in life, but that's not the point that Luke is trying to make. The ultimate point is, who is this Jesus and what should our response to him be? Who is this Jesus? He's the one who can speak to the wind and the waves, the raging waters, and they must be still. They must obey. And then, especially linking it in with Jesus' redefinition of his family, what he's saying is this, if even the winds and the waters obey him because he's the Lord of all creation, how much more should we obey Jesus? That's what this passage means. Close your Bible and go home. No. <laughs> Remember that. Remember that. And then, if we're going to take that traditional approach to this and say, well, it's about Jesus bringing peace in the midst of the storm, let's at least recognize this. The peace comes because the disciples are being obedient to what Jesus said to do when they got into the boat. See, your purpose in life starts with a word from God. Your peace starts with God's presence, but then it goes on to God's purpose. And just so you know that I'm not just, you know, drawing something out of thin air and making a point just to satisfy my desire to make a point, that this is not some one-off. This is a principle that Jesus himself teaches not only through his actions here, but his direct words elsewhere. You can see Matthew 11, verse 29. And he's speaking to a bunch of people who were just burdened by a lot of religious stuff. And they were stressed out in life because they weren't able to fulfill all the demands of a heavy-handed religious system. And Jesus says this, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And what will happen? You will find rest for your souls. What does taking Jesus' yoke upon yourself mean? Well, number one, it means that you get rid of the yoke of human bondage, a religious system that's all about human rules. Do this, don't do that, you know, just a bunch of rules. Don't take that yoke, but take Jesus' yoke. He's gentle and humble, but here's the thing about a yoke. A yoke has a purpose. A yoke is an instrument that was used to harness the power of an ox. A yoke was used to produce something. A yoke was a part of a process that would lead to a harvest, that would lead to fruitfulness. And Jesus says, yeah, don't take on their yoke, but take on mine. And then when you take my yoke, my purpose is for your life. You'll find rest for your souls. It's good, isn't it? Yeah, and that's really what we see with the disciples getting into the boat. If you want to know God's purposes and you want to move toward those purposes and have the rest for your soul, the peace for your life that God intends, then it starts with obedience to a word from God. And I can guarantee you that God has given us plenty to obey, plenty of commands. They're there. It's not popular to talk about in today's evangelical religious circles, but God has given us some commands. And I believe that God wants to give some very specific directions to every individual here. But before we get to such specific directions and, you know, how do I know this is God's will? And, you know, what is God's direction for my life? Does he want me to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever? You know, what has God commanded right here? And if, nothing, if we know nothing else, we know that we're commanded, first of all, to love God with all of our heart and soul and mind 
and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. If we just get started with that, we'll be on the way. But God has called us to obedience. And I can tell you this, as unpopular as the idea about obedience, and you know, a lot of times we think, well, obedience is not important to God because that's part of the yoke of just religious bondage, human effort in place of God's presence and God's peace in our lives. And so we too easily dismiss the importance of obedience. And here's the thing. If you dismiss obedience to the Lord, you're going to dismiss his purposes for your life. And if you dismiss his purposes, you dismiss peace. God wants you to have peace. And it's hard to be at peace when you're not where you're supposed to be in the Lord. Isn't that true? It's hard to be at peace when you're living in disobedience to the Lord. It's hard to be at peace when you're somewhere that God doesn't want you to be. It's hard to be at peace. I've heard it said that generally Jewish people, there are Messianic Jews, but generally Jews don't recognize Jesus as the Christ. Protestants don't recognize the Pope. And Victory Church members don't recognize each other in Hooters. Don't get mad at me for saying that. If you work at Hooters or whatever, just make it a point. Actually, there was a time that I felt sorry for Hooters. Uh, a few years ago, our denomination had its general council, its biannual convention in Phoenix. And across from the Phoenix Convention Center, there's this row of restaurants, kind of like a storefront with lots of restaurants. And at lunchtime... I looked across the street at all these restaurants and out the door of every restaurant there was a long line of people, but there was one restaurant, there was nobody in line. <laughs> I don't know what it was. These are some of the God pastors who just didn't want to recognize each other in Hooters, I guess. They, <laughs> nobody was there. Nobody was going in Hooters. So, you know, I'm free. I'm free in the spirit. So you know what I did? I went to a Mexican restaurant, is what I did. <laughs> wasn't about to go in there. <laughs> yeah, again, Hooters isn't the issue. In fact, my father-in-law, he passed away three or four years ago now at age 94. And when he was pretty close to 90, he had been out and about. He drove until he was about 90. And... Uh, like, Don, where have you been? Oh, I went to lunch. Where would you go to lunch? Hooters. <laughs> so why would you go to Hooters? <laughs> I thought it was so hilarious. He said, well, I heard they had good oysters. So, you know, the, the moral of the story is if you're close to 90 and you want good oysters, go to Hooters. But, you know, <laughs> otherwise, you know, you might want to think about your choices. The whole point of that, I'm just trying to have a little fun. Because I have some real medicine here, and the medicine is God has called us to obey him. And you don't want to be anywhere that God doesn't want you. You don't want to do anything that God doesn't want you to do. But it's not just, you know, refraining from going certain places and refraining from doing certain things. It is that you want to be where God has called you to be and you want to do everything God has called you to do because when you pursue God's purposes you have peace See, I know this from experience and not from going into Hooters never been in one but I know from other experience that you can't live in knowing and willful disobedience to God and have peace in your heart and if you don't have peace with God, you don't have peace in your life. I mean, he's the creator. He's the one who made you. He's the one who loves you. He's the one who sent his son to die for you. He, he's the one who's so passionately in love with you, he will kick down every wall, tear down every lie to get to you. He loves you. 
He loves you so much. And if you want peace, you find it in him. And when you're living in disobedience to him, contrary to his will, you will not be at peace. It doesn't mean that, you know, we have to replace our faith in God and our vital relationship with him with a bunch of rules. But it does mean that God has some principles in his word, some commands in his word, that if we hear his words and put them into practice, then we will have peace in his presence. And here's the thing. I've seen this in, in the church world after, you know, 40 years of following Jesus. A lot of times people think that obedience doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter whether I obey or not. You know, I'm not legalistic. Well, even the early church had to deal with that, and the early New Testament writers dealt with that. They called it licentiousness, using grace as a license. Grace, the grace of God, is not a license to disobey God. Grace of God is not permission to disobey God. You know, it's not like, well, you know, misquoting Romans, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I can just do whatever I want to do because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But 1 John also talks about your own heart condemning you. And your own heart will, God won't condemn you, but your own heart will. You will not be in peace apart from obeying God. So you can claim grace for forgiveness of sin. You can claim grace for forgiveness of sin over and over again. But until you know God's grace as power over sin, not just forgiveness from sin, until you know God's grace as power over sin, you're not going to have peace. Because here's the reality. You, by your own strength and own willpower, cannot obey God. You can't. That's why we need grace. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. So you can only obey by the power of the Holy Spirit. We learn to obey. We learn to depend upon God to obey. He helps us. He wants you to because he has a good plan for your life. And he wants you to be in that relationship of peace where you know you're just at peace with him. He doesn't condemn you. Your own heart doesn't condemn you. And then John says, when we have that kind of peace in our heart, we can pray and ask God and we know that he's going to move. It's powerful. It's a powerful way of living. Obedience is important. It's, a, it's important to teach obedience as parents. Did you know that? Why is it important to teach obedience? I bet a lot of people aren't teaching that today. But you know, the only times the Bible, in the New Testament, at least I know for sure, the only times the New Testament specifically addresses children, it has one command, both times that it addresses children, and that is to obey your parents. Why is it important that you, as old-fashioned, church-going parents, teach your children to obey? Why would that be important? Just because we're old-fashioned? No, not at all. has nothing to do with that. has nothing to do with, you know, making your children obey because you want life to be easier for you. <laughs> making your children obey because they make you mad when they don't obey. It's not that. You teach your children to obey because when they learn to obey the authorities that God has put in their lives, you, parents, you're setting them up to embrace, to accept the concept that they are to live lives in obedience to God himself. That sets them up for peace. That sets them up for God's purposes in their lives. You know, I, when I was a young pastor with no kids, Lisa and I had no kids, I sometimes had to teach on the family. And I would teach things like this, obedience, but I had no experience and it worked. You know why it worked? Because it was the Word of God. But now, you know, I have two daughters. Lisa and I have two daughters, ages 23 and 21. They've been obedient to the call of God on their lives. They're at Hillsong College in Sydney, Australia. They're 
they've accepted God's call on their lives in ministry, and they're good kids. They, you know, they, they never produce any kind of heartache and uh, don't believe they, they ever will at this point in their lives, just going after God. And I think part of it was that we taught obedience in our household. And um, we had this phrase that we borrowed from a Christian teacher on parenting called instant obedience. We taught instant obedience. I shortened that to instant O. All right, Haley, instant O. Anna, instant O. Instant obedience. And, you know, it just became. And one of the principles that that parenting teacher taught was that you need to teach your kids that it's not just willpower, but you need to pray and ask God to help you to obey your parents. Right? Makes sense. Otherwise, it's just bondage. So we, w- we would teach obedience. And, and they were good at it. Except, I, I will say, Haley, the older one, she had this, I don't know, this little bit of rebellion. And you, you, you know, she's going to be embarrassed that her dad preached about her, but yeah. But she had this little habit. Let's say she was banging on the table, just for example. And you would say, Haley, stop banging on the table. She would look at you and then stop. Like, and it made it so hard to punish her because she stopped. But she, she just had that one little, that last one, like, stop, look at you. I'm going to exert my independence. I'm going to obey you, but I want you to know that, you know, I'm my own person. We were joking about that a few months back when we were together as family. She said, you know, I still have to have the last word. <laughs> I'm glad she's married to Paul Riley. (laughs) Yeah. He lets her have the last word, I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah. Why, Why is it important for kids to obey? Because it's important for all of us to learn to obey God. It's still important. You know, the principles of... The Ten Commandments still apply. I'm amazed. I'm flabbergasted because almost all my adult life, everybody has accepted that the Ten Commandments are still for today. You know, that we don't have any idols, that we worship God, that we don't commit adultery, we don't lie, we don't steal, all those things. And one of those is the Sabbath. And nowadays, not just with regard to the Sabbath, but with regard to any other of the Ten Commandments. Oh, that's Old Testament. That doesn't apply. Don't you believe it? There are ritual laws that do not apply because they were fulfilled in Jesus, but the moral law of the Old Testament still applies. And this whole concept of Sabbath keeping, you know, I know as New Testament followers of Jesus, we have biblical evidence that they gathered together to worship God on the first day of the week and not just the seventh day of week, the Sabbath. I think what is important, as with a whole lot of other Old Testament principles, is the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. And the important thing is that God made us for a weekly cycle. It's set in the order of creation, a weekly day of rest, a weekly day that's not just for us to go to the beach, but it's a day for us to worship God. Isaiah is clear about that. It's a day for us to worship. And we somehow think that it's just a a rule that we're expected to go to church weekly. Let me tell you, God wants us to obey because He wants you to be in a position of greatest blessing. He wants to pour out His peace on your life. He wants you to be at peace with Him. And part of a life of weekly worship as the family of God is for our benefit, not for His. God wants us to obey all the Ten Commandments. And I believe that's a part of it. I don't know why I chose to pick on that particular thing today. It's not written in my notes. But I know that in America, it's increasingly the case that people decreasingly attend church. I was in a meeting this past week being led by a pastor of 10,000 people. They have 10,000 people a Sunday. But he was bemoaning the fact that now the average churchgoer attends only once or twice a month. 
And I know that's not true for a whole lot of people here, but it's generally true across the nation. And let me just say, God's not going to be able to send revival to people who don't prioritize coming together to worship God. I'm praying for and believing for the day when the people of Victory Church Every one of us will be able to say, I was glad when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. Let's go meet with God. Let's go worship together as the family of God. Let's go receive what God has for us through his word and through his presence. Yes, you can experience his word and his presence in your daily life, in your personal quiet times, and those times are absolutely vital. But there are things that God wants to do when we gather together in his name as his family, as his people that go beyond that. God wants you to experience that. Amen. I take, I've, I've taken up sermon time about obedience to tell you, man, make worship a part of that. And I believe God wants you to, to really grasp that. Obey. Obey God. Instant obedience. Yes, God. Okay, I'll do it now. <laughs> See, just we should make obedience to God the default. Just God, if you say it, I'm going to do it. See, so we we should have such trust in God that we we know when He gives us a command to obey. Yes, obey. Put into practice that it's for our own good. When Jesus had been awakened from his sleep and he calmed the storm and these disciples you know were looking at Jesus what was his question to them where's your faith where's your faith see our faith ought to be such that we trust God that if he tells us to do something then he's going to be with us in that and he's going to watch over us so we trust God that no matter what comes our way, when we're pursuing God's purposes for our lives, when we're living obedient lives, then no matter the fact that my obedience now ends up with me in the middle of the lake in the midst of a storm and waves are swamping the boat and we're being threatened with drowning, that somehow God's going to work it out. I, I, I just, I, I'm, an, I'm a Romans 8.28 kind of believer. What does Romans 8, 28 say? God works all things. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Do you love him this morning? That's what worship is. That's why we want to do it regularly. It's an expression of love. But notice there's another part of a life in which God works all things together for good. Who have been called according to his purpose. We've all been called, but there's an implication behind that. And the implication is you have been called and you have responded. You said, yes, Lord. And because I've said, yes, Lord, because I have said, yes, God, I'll obey you. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to do. I'll serve how you want me to serve. I'll bless how you want me to bless. And because of that, I've been called according to his purpose. I know that God is going to work in all things for my good and for your good. Amen? I just know it. I just believe it. God is going to work for our good. And when God is working like that, we can trust him. We can trust him. We can trust that when he says, let us go to the other side, what does that mean? We're going to get to the other side. Amen? Let us go to the other side. It is a command. It's a third person kind of command, but it's a command. It's a command form, but it's also a promise. So much of what we see in Scripture, we hear, oh, that's a command. There's a promise with it. There's a promise. You're going to get to the other side. And if God says, get in the boat, let's go to the other side, guess where you're going to end up? On the other side, you're not going to end up at the bottom of the sea. You're going to end up on the other side. Back when I was in seminary, and I wrote about this in our weekly email this past week, but want to share that for those of you who didn't click on and open my email. I'm hurt, but 
<laughs> when I was a seminary student, I was selected for this all-expense-paid trip to Acapulco. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Uh, but it was a missions trip. Medical missions during the day and uh, evangelistic campaign every night. And I, at that time, was very fluent in Spanish. It had not been long that since I had been in Panama for three years in the Army, and I had a linguist rating and worked with the Panamanian National Guard, so my Spanish was really good. And uh, so I went to translate for the medical missions team. That's part of why I was selected for this group. And it was awesome. We saw great things happening. At night, we saw hundreds, maybe even thousands come to the Lord. It was an amazing experience. And uh, even on the afternoon off, we had one day, went to the market, and I met this lady and offered to pray for her for anything she needed prayer for. And she said, oh, my, my daughter can't see very well. Pray for her. So I began to pray for her daughter, asked the daughter then, can you, you know, read something you couldn't have read before? And she took a book and just read it perfectly. The mom's crying like, ah, oh, praise the Lord. It was just an amazing time. And on the trip back from Acapulco, you know, we had a flight to either Houston or Dallas and then from there to Tulsa. And on the flight into Tulsa, I, I was not real happy with my seat assignment. And, you know, not so much my assignment, I had an aisle seat, but I wasn't real happy with who they assigned for the middle seat. And this guy was huge. And, you know, he, he spread over into my area. But I didn't dare say anything to him because the reason he spread over into my seat space, not because he was overweight, it was because he was a lineman for the, for the University of Miami football team. This guy was huge. And so we just stayed friendly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he shared some of his experience as a football player, and I shared some of mine, you know, and he was really intrigued about my being a seminary student and having been to Acapulco. I don't know if he believed that I didn't get to go to the beach, but uh, we talked. Then, you know, it was time to land, and it was a foggy day, cloudy day, and, you know, you're making our descent, and there wasn't a break. You couldn't see anything. You could barely see the tip of the wing out the window, and we were going down, 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 and if you've flown any amount of time, you know, you can hear the the landing gear drop, and you can hear the change and how the wind sounds going over the flaps on the wings. I mean, you know when, you know usually when you're about to touch down, and we were at that point, still couldn't see anything, when all of a sudden the pilot gunned it, and we shot straight back up, it was like, ah! Man, you, you know when to be afraid on an airplane? When the uh, flight attendants look afraid, then, you know, and this was one of those things, it was obvious that something had gone wrong. Don't know what, they didn't make an announcement, we just made the loop and came back and had a landing that was just very normal. And uh, this big macho football player, he looked over at me, and you know, people had clapped and all that, like, oh, he landed. And uh, he said, wow, that was really something. I almost asked you to say a prayer. <laughs> almost. But here, here's the thing, and, and you know, I, I, can I brag a little bit? This guy was afraid, this big hulk of a man, and I was at perfect peace, I promise you. I've had other times since then that I wasn't at perfect peace, but I was, at that moment, I was just so at peace. And the reason was I just had this thought, God has a call in my life. I'm answering God's call. There are still some things that he has for me to do, and he's not done with me yet. There's no way I'm going to die. There's nothing going to happen to me. I'll be 60 in a little over a week, right? I'm still not done yet. I get out on my Harley and ride. Guess what? I believe God wanted me to buy that Harley and not so that he could kill me out on the highway. <laughs> I play it safe. I'm ultra defensive in my Harley riding, but I just, I really do feel that. God's not done yet. 
He's not done with you yet either. Amen. And when we know we're in God's will, it doesn't mean that nothing bad will ever happen. It doesn't mean that the storms won't come in. It doesn't mean that everything will go perfectly, but it does mean that we can have a peace and a confidence in the midst of the storm because we trust our God to be working these things together for our good. Amen? Uh, how many of you have heard of John Wesley? John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, he probably did more to change Christianity than anybody since the Apostle Paul or maybe Martin Luther. But he's right up there with them. And one of the things that made the difference in his life, because he was a missionary serving just out of legalism. And he got on this boat with a bunch of Moravian people from where? Pennsylvania, maybe? I don't know, but he was on a boat with a bunch of Moravian people, and when the storm came, he was like afraid, like, oh, what if I die? What, you know, will I go to heaven? He, he had no confidence whatsoever, and yet the Moravians were standing in a circle on the ship holding hands and singing hymns to God. Like, oh, how do they have such peace? I'll tell you how they have such peace. Faith in God. Where's your faith, Jesus asked his disciples. Amen. Where's your face? So, you know, we see that there's a word to obey. There's a purpose to fulfill. And part of that purpose is this. There's a person to be set free on the other side. See, it's not just go to the other side of the lake and you're going to find your beach and you can relax and you can rest from the crowds that you had experienced on the front side of the lake. No, it's not about that. It's about going to this other place. It's a place that was pagan. You can tell because in that place there was a herd of pigs. You didn't have too many herds of pigs in the Jewish-dominated area. Why not? Because pigs are not kosher. And you, you, you have a group of people that need what Jesus has. They need what the disciples are learning how to receive. And so in Luke 8, 26, it says, They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. That wasn't just the man. Those were the demons inside of him. In fact, when Jesus asked who this demon was, the demon responded, I'm legion, for we are many. And that's why when Jesus cast the demon out, they demons they went into multiple pigs and ran over a cliff into the lake and that struck fear in the hearts of the people in the region but there was a man that God wanted to deliver for Jesus verse 29 for Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man many times it had seized him and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places but after Jesus cast those demons out, it says that the people of the town came and they found this man that they couldn't bind before, that they couldn't control, that they couldn't contain, who had superhuman power. They found him clothed and in his right mind. Why did Jesus want to go to the other side? Because he had a mission. And he has a mission to which he is called you. In fact, all of the Gospel of Luke and the other book that he wrote, which is what? The book of Acts. Luke wrote Luke and Acts. They go together. They're two parts of a book with the same message. And the message is this. Jesus has come to set captives free, and you as the people of God are invited into Jesus' mission. There are people who need to be set free. And as we pursue God's purposes, as we seek first His kingdom, His rule, His reign, as we work together to drive out the forces of darkness from individual lives and from whole regions, guess what? God is with us. And people will be set free. And we will find the peace that can be found in no other way than saying yes to the call of God on our lives. I believe that's what God wants for this church. God has called us to be a part of setting captives free. 
I believe 2019 can be the best year ever in the history of the church here at Victory. We can set people free like never before. Now, you might think, oh, that casting demon out, demons out sounds kind of freaky. Well, it's not that freaky. In fact, I just noticed, I was just thumbing through the menu just uh, during announcements because I heard all the announcements in the first service today, so I was <laughs> permitted to do something different than what was going on up here, right? <laughs> and I noticed that we have, on Tuesday nights, a life group based on the book Unbound, which teaches freedom. I encourage you to be a part of that. How many of you already signed up for that? It's life group number, I didn't write down the number. What, life group number 12? How many of you already signed up for life group number 12? A few of you? They look normal. You can sign up and just be with them. Yeah. But this is the mission of Jesus. And this was not part of my sermon, but I, I just really feel it's, it's part of God's word for us today from Luke chapter 4, where Jesus sets forth his agenda and what, by virtue of the book of Acts, is an invitation for his disciples to take up his agenda. He says this, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. That's freedom and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Amen? Amen. This is that time. This is the time to step into your purpose, to step into the promises of God. And in every command, let me tell you, there's a promise that goes along with it. There's a promise. And one of the greatest promises is that you can have peace with God. And again, how do you obey? You don't obey by your own strength. That's just a bunch of religious rules. You obey. You obey the will of God, but you do it out of the grace of God, out of this knowledge that Jesus died. And when the Father looks at me, he doesn't see my sin. He sees the purity of his Son. And when you know that, and you know that the purity or the righteousness of Jesus is how God sees you, guess what that does? It, it really frees you to obey God like you never could do just by saying, I'm going to obey, I'm going to obey, I'm not going to eat those potato chips, and then you eat the whole bag. You know, it's a focus on the grace and the goodness of God. But the first step is to get into the boat with Jesus. Get into the boat. Doesn't mean a storm's not going to come up. But get into the boat with him, because with him is the safest place you can be in life. I want to ask everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes. Have you ever consciously surrendered your life to Jesus? Have you, have you ever consciously said, God, okay, I'm going to get into the boat, and I'm going to let you lead my life where you want to take it? If you've never done that, then we're going to pray a prayer of surrender to that. And what I want to ask you to do is, if you would say, I want to be included in that prayer. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Then when I count to three, I want to ask you to raise your hand, to be bold about that. Don't worry about what anybody sitting near you might think if they happen to be looking out of the corner of their eye and see you raising their hand. It doesn't matter because this is about you and your relationship with Jesus. And he's going to come into your life today. And things will never be the same. You're going to have peace like you can't have any other way. There's some of you who, you made that decision at one point in your life, but you wandered away from God and you wandered away from the peace that comes from uh, an ongoing relationship with Him. Let me tell you one thing. He's never left you. He's never forsaken you. But He is wanting you to return to that place of relationship with him. So whether you're for the first time saying, yes, Jesus, I want to live my life with you and for you, or whether you're coming back to Jesus, when I say three, just raise your hand. One, Jesus loves you so much. Two, 
three. Just raise your hand. That's me. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. A couple of people over to my right. A couple of people here in the center. Three or four people to my left. Amen. You can put your hands down. Let's all pray this prayer out loud. Let's reaffirm our faith in Jesus. And even if you didn't raise your hand, if you want to surrender to God, maybe you had a little bit of fear about raising your hand, just pray this from your heart. And it's not because it's religious words. It's because of your heart wanting Jesus, inviting a man that will make the difference. So just say this. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love me you love me so much that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I turn from sin and I turn to you, God. Be the Lord of my life. Help me to live for you. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to be what you created me to be. Help me to do what you created me to do. Give me your peace, God. Give me your joy. I receive your love. I'm now your child. I'll be your child forever. In Jesus' name, amen.